In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Colin McGinn at his apartment in New York, we discussed at some length the meaning of the word belief. And much of that discussion is in the Atheism series. But to begin with, I just wanted to get from Colin a sense of what it felt like to be a sceptical English philosopher in a country as seemingly religious as the United States. Sometimes Americans will, will say, so you don't believe in God? And I say, that's right, I don't believe in God. And they say, so do you believe in anything? Oh, yes. Do you believe in anything? And I say, I believe in many things, uh, and I don't make jokes to them about I believe in tables and chairs, and I say to them, you know, I believe in various ethical causes and political ideas and other aesthetic values, intellectual values, lots of things that I believe in. And they say, they say, that's all you believe in. I say, that's all I believe in. Don't you believe in something God-like? You don't, oh, you don't believe in the traditional God. Don't you believe there's something there? And I say, no, there's nothing there. And it's very difficult to get across to people when, who are religious, when, you, that you're, when you're an atheist, you mean you don't believe in anything like that whatsoever. Mm. It's not that you think nature is God, or it doesn't have personal qualities, or something like that. You don't believe in anything of that type. Any, nothing supernatural, nothing miraculous, nothing superstitious, mm. no ghosts, no telepathy, you know. Nothing of that kind, that's what it's to do with. It's not that I'm picking on God, you know, somehow, or picking on the Christian God and not believing in him. Mm. I'm, it's just nothing of that type. And that's well, what you've got don't you then get the answer which I get from people who are not necessarily religious? I mean, they don't belong to either or any of the three uh, monotheistic religions. They will say, not just simply, there must be something, mm. to which I would give the same reply as you, mm. but... Uh, where do you get your spirituality? Mm. Oh, yeah, I suppose. And it sounds as if yeah. otherwise there's a shortage of some sort, but I've never yeah. been able to get from them whether it's yeah. like some vitamin deficiency. Exactly. What do they exactly do they mean by that? Uh, I mean, spiritual. Do, do can an atheist be spiritual? I guess it's a matter of definition, really. I mean, you can't certainly can't be if it connotes anything supernatural, but. You know, aesthetic and his ethical values can approximate to what people call the spirit. You know, your most deeply held beliefs about human behaviour might be counted as spiritual, I don't know. Your feelings about nature, I suppose, might be. I mean, I wouldn't use the word. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be a good word to use, to, a risky word to use, but it doesn't mean you don't have, a, you know, any deep views about things, you know, think, or deep convictions about things. Well, but that's often where people I feel always that. say the clergyman crouching in the laurel bushes leaps out and says, ah, your deep feelings are, in fact, unacknowledged uh, oh, yeah. acknowledgements of uh, the God you deny. Yeah, well, one of my deep feelings is that it, there is no God, and it's a bad idea to believe in God, and it's been very harmful. So if that reflects my belief in God, well, <laughs> that's a strange situation. That's one of my deepest convictions, is there is no God. Now, I happen to share Colin's conviction that there is no God. And in my case, I never believed it. So I wondered if there had ever been a time in Colin's earlier life when he did believe in God. Well, with me, it was actually quite precisely delineated. It was, uh, I can't remember the exact dates now, you know, the exact times, but I think I was about 17 or 18 when the idea of believing in God, and it was Christianity that I was exposed to, became real to me. And it went on for about a year, I would say. Not much more than that. 
If you'd said to me when I was 10, what, do you believe in God? I probably would have said yes, I don't know. But it didn't mean anything, it was just sort of, you know, everybody does, don't they? I mean, mm. like the cows, you know, everybody believes mm. in them, right? <laughs> so, so it went, and then, but then I actually started studying the Bible because I was studying divinity A-level. So I started studying it, but we had a very charismatic teacher, an admirable man, Mr. Marsh, who I wrote about in my autobiography, who was very enthusiastic and he was teaching us the Bible and I was having to learn the Bible studying it closely, you know, it's like Old Testament, New Testament. So I know much more about the New Testament than most Christians right now. And I, even now, 25 years later, I know more about it than most religious people. So I actually know it pretty well. It's what got me interested in philosophy. So at the same time I was getting interested in philosophy, it was through thinking about religion, studying the Bible. And I think there were two factors, a confluence of two factors here. One was the interest in metaphysical questions basic questions about the universe, how, you know, what's it all about, what does it all mean, that kind of question. And on the other hand, there was an ethical component to it, because you find in the New Testament, obviously, mm. a very strong emphasis on ethical aspects of life. I was an idealistic teenager, you know, and it was in the 60s, so that had a profound impact on me, that I, the ethical side, and I was not brought up in a house where ethical ideas were particularly discussed or, you know, and it still has a profound impact on me, the ethical side of it. So those two things, I think, made me think there was more to life than the mundane realities that I'd been used to, living up there in Blackpool, you know, mm -hmm. with the amusement arcades and the pubs and fish and chip shops, you know, and the freezing cold. And There was this idea of philosophical thought, metaphysical ideas, and then these high I ethical ideals. A good combination, right? A good combination. So. I got interested in it, and so for a period uh, I was influenced by that. And I went to university studying psychology. And since I stopped studying the Bible, I wasn't seeing Mr. Marsh anymore for our divinity lessons. I kept it up a bit, but it and I was and then occasionally would talk to people about religion, and it just sort of disappeared. And I remember going out. I remember sort of trying hard to keep up with it, going to some sort of religious meeting, and I just was sitting and listening. To it, and I thought, this is a load of rubbish. I just don't think this is true anymore. And then I, I was reading Bertrand Russell, Why I'm Not a Christian, and in a few matters, I don't remember the details, but in a pretty short time I just decided it was all wrong. But and I also you... decided you could keep the ethical side and the philosophical side and jettison the rest. So Russell represented to me an alternative to religious idealism. It was a more, you know, it was a secular idealism. So I realized you could have some of the aspects of religion which appealed to me, you could have without religion. And the bits that didn't appeal to me, like, you know, the virgin birth, miracles, strange ideas about how the universe came around, the sort of bits it's very hard to believe, um, you could just cut those bits off and you could keep the good bits. So you get rid of the, the, the theological baggage of religion and then you keep the sides of it that you like. And that's what I have ever done ever since, <laughs> basically the same thing. Um, Was there any crisis in, as it were, uh, unhitching the metaphysical and divine from the ethical to which you continue not, to Not subscribe. in my case, which is, uh, it, I think it differs from other people's case. In Russell's own description of his fall from theism, he describes it as a deeply painful, traumatic, mm. irrecoverable episode. He spent his whole life somehow dealing with it. Not with me, it, it was relatively easy, it just happened quite naturally. As, as I say in my autobiography, it was it's like shedding the skin when, you know, the skin comes off and you have a new skin and it, it seems fine. Was there a sense of relief as you shed the skin? No, I wouldn't say there was relief. Disapp I think there was disappointment. Ah. Oh. Uh, I would have liked, I mean, I would like religion to be true. I'd like it to be true. Because I'd like to be, I'd like there to be immortality. I'd like there to be rewards for those who've been virtuous and punishments for those who've not been virtuous, especially the punishments would be good. You know, there's not, there's no justice in this world. <laughs> Uh, and it would be good if there was some cosmic force that distributed justice in the proper way that it should be. And it still is, to me, a constant source of irritation and pain that wicked people prosper and virtuous people don't. So there's a, there was a bit of disappointment about those aspects of it. And but there was some exhilaration too. I mean, Russell has a description which I think is kind of appropriate of a feeling of a godless universe. It's a kind of exhilarating universe. It's something hygienic about it, there's something bracing about it. Whereas the idea that there's this sort of suffocating presence gazing at your every movement and thought, you know, and 
gauging everything you do, and uh, it's a bit it's a bit oppressive to think that way. Well, okay. Now here you are, uh, the, the philosopher that you thought you might become. Yeah. You have now um, very fully become. Now, in your role as a philosopher, I'd love you to develop the arguments which were previously simply intuitional skin shedding. Yeah. Um, now be more systematic and yes. surgical about yes. it and say yes. why, in fact, yes. the notion of a god well, is incredible. The one set of arguments is the sort of no evidence arguments. Uh, Russell puts it by saying, there's no more reason to believe in the Christian God than the Greek gods. No more reason to believe. In other words, there's no positive evidence for it. Um, I mean, there's no theory that you need to postulate God in to explain some natural phenomenon, which can't be explained by some other theory. People say sometimes, will say, well, miracles were performed. There's never any good evidence that miracles were performed. The judgment that they were is usually based on a prior opinion that God exists rather than being an independent source for believing that God exists. So, so there's no evidence in terms of what anybody's ever observed. There's no fact about the world that can't be explained without postulating God. So there's no reason to believe in God, any more than there's any reason to believe in Zeus or any of the Greek gods. So that's on the side of whether there's any reason to believe it. There's the question now, are there reasons to disbelieve it? Are there any positive arguments against it? Mm. Um, there are also some arguments for, like the ontological argument. I don't know if talk about the ontological argument. Well, well, tell us what that argument the is. The ontological argument. This is a very nice argument. Anselm of Canterbury thought of it. I think it must be in the 15th century. Um, he argued that the definition of God entails that God exists. Now, this would be a fantastic result, right, if that... Just the mere definition tells that God exists. So, what's the definition of God? The most perfect conceivable being, or let's say the most powerful conceivable being is an equally good way of putting it. And then Anselm argues as follows. Well, suppose this most powerful or most perfect being did not exist, right? Then he would lack the attribute of existence. But the attribute of existence is one of the perfections, or one of the things which makes a being powerful. But since he is by definition the most perfect being, he must have the attribute of existence. Therefore, God exists. Right. So let's go over the argument again. Yes. <laughs> Get the definition of God. How is God to be defined? Let, let's compare this with the unicorn. Well, how is a unicorn to be defined? A unicorn is a horse with a horn growing out of the middle of its head. There's nothing in that definition to imply that unicorns exist and unicorns don't exist. But let's define God, right? An all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing being. Right? These are some of his characteristics. And everybody will agree that's the definition of God. So, now, one of the definitions is, he's the most perfect being. One of his attributes is utmost perfection, unimprovable perfection. Okay, that's, one of, that's the definition of God. Now, Anselm argues, but if God didn't exist, wouldn't he be less perfect than a being just like him in all those attributes, except that that being existed? Because to exist is to be more perfect than not to exist. It's better to exist than not to exist. God is as good as you can be, as superior as you can be, so he must exist. So we know by definition that God exists. It's a brilliant argument, right, but it's wholly unconvincing to everybody who hears it. They think there's something going wrong with that, you know. That's a very strange argument. All right, tell us what's wrong, what's well, wrong with it. Well, the difficulty is nobody's ever managed to pinpoint exactly what's wrong with it. I'll tell you what I think is wrong with it, mm. though the issue is, is not by no means clear. I think what's very funny in the art, the bit that goes, science strikes you as sophistical, is the bit that says, God's the most perfect. Existence is one of the perfections. It sounds superficially plausible, but what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. right? It's one of the perfections. I like to compare this to somebody who said, let's take the most tasty meal that conceivable. Mm -hmm. the, most con the most tasty meal conceivable. Does that, is that mean anything to say that? This is the most tasty meal I've ever had, but it's not well defined, the most tasty meal conceivable. Or, you know, the best football game conceivable. Not the way I've ever seen. What does it mean? I mean, it doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a very clearly meaningful idea. So if we, say, if we say we're defining God as the most perfect being, and we don't really lay down very clearly what we mean by perfect, then what does it really mean, the most perfect being? You know, he has... He only doesn't have the most perfect colours, because he's not coloured at all. You know, what, what does it... It's not clear what it means. So we can't always think that phrases like the most perfect conceivable F are always meaningful. Sometimes they are meaningful. The most perfect conceivable triangle. It means one whose angles are precisely 180 degrees. 
but the most perfect conceivable moral being, what does that mean?